good afternoon and uh, thank you for visiting us. I see I have a large crowd in front of me, so I'll try to keep it terse here. And uh, in fact, it's good. It allows us to be a bit more intimate and answer questions uh, on a personal basis as well. Uh, the presentation is uh, about sub trunking, which is becoming a really uh, popular phenomena around the world. What I've tried to divide is basically an introduction part, not wasting your time much on that. We dwell on the issues a lot, uh, the kind of issues that service providers face when deploying sub trunking, and try to have a look at how Patton thinks uh, those issues can be solved. So if, if we can start. What SIP trunking basically is, it's basically sending your telephony packets or the IP backbone of the service provider. Uh, I, d I want to simplify the meaning here because uh, SIP trunking is that simple. It's basically sending IP packets of your telephony traffic or the backbone. Uh, it typically is associated and integrated with uh, local and long distance calling. This was something which started the move towards SIP trunking, but eventually there is more to SIP trunking than just long distance calling. There is unified communications with applications like Presence, you know, where you can find me, follow me applications included in it. You could basically have point of presence in your business communications all the time. You have E911 type emergency calling, directory listing of calls, and many more applications. One of the applications that I personally like the most is integrating it with your CRM system, customer support system. Basically what that does is it allows customers to contact you in a lot of ways based upon your presence. They could be on the website of the company, they could just click a link, and that could uh, initiate a call as well. And so I think uh, typical SIP trunking has come a long way, and if you combine these features, it makes a lot of compelling reasons for businesses to go towards SIP trunking. Because I'm sure many of you get asked questions of why the need to move to SIP trunking. My existing telephony is working perfectly fine with me. Uh, and the motivation behind doing it is not only enabling these features, but enabling your business in particular. You want to be available to your customers, whether it's your support cycle, sales cycle, with uh, all pace possible. And so I think it is this family which is going to enable uh, unified communications and thus your business in general. Uh, I, want to I want to take a moment in uh, looking over the technology. I like this graph a lot. Um, we started off all TDM, as you can see, service providers were at TDM, the enterprises were at TDM, and now there is a phase shift. The service providers are moving towards IP, the enterprises are moving towards IP. However, they're moving at completely different paces. The result is that there are some transients where service providers are at IP, but the enterprises are still at TDM-based offerings. Or the service providers prefer TDM-based offerings, the enterprises have moved on to IP. This is the transient phase where I think there's going to be a need for VoIP gateways and there's going to be a need for SIP trunking with the legacy infrastructure. Let's go ahead and look at the old school model because uh, having a look at uh, what SIP trunking does would be incomplete without looking at what we used to do previously. This is how the old PSTN and data network looked like. As I like to call, there were silos. Uh, your PSTN network was completely different from your IP data network. You would get three bills. If, if it was a really good service provider, you would bundle the local and long distance calling together. But typically, you would get three bills. There was the problem of the legacy PBX, which was bought like five years ago, six years ago, even more. And it's not only difficult to maintain, you might have service contracts with agencies which, which made it even more cost costly for you. Uh, on top of that, this PBX added no functions at all. Uh, no SIP trunking, no IP enabling. Uh, and so you're kind of stuck in a rut and uh, there needs to be a way out to make uh, this picture into a picture which is beneficial to you, which allows you to save cost on local and long distance calling, which allows you to s unify these silos, which allows you to do convergence and thus enable communications and collaborations. Uh, what, what I mean by that is, is the same thing that we went over previously, is that you want to be available the enterprises want to be available to their customers at all points of time. Let's have a look at the modern day picture. This is what SIP trunking does in, in its very simplicity. It's trying to unify those two silos that we saw out there, the data network and the voice network. Make it easy for, for the end customer. You know, He has a single bill, he has a single point uh, which he has to worry about. On top of that, this legacy PBX that he invested in like 10 years ago, five years ago, gets added value 
to it. You can now have it connect to a SIP trunking uh, solution, have long distance calling with it. Not only that, if your gateway is capable enough, you increase the capabilities of your PBX as well. You can do a legacy extensions as well as IP based extensions on a sim same platform. On top of that, what you do is you enable your business as a whole to become a single entity. As you can see from the figure here, the main office is connected via smart node. And the advantage here is all your systems get integrated inside a single platform. So a customer trying to reach, uh, trying to reach your main office would reach via either extensions or your website or IAM. It just, there is no limit to the way the customers can reach you. I know it's bad for the other functions of the company, but for customer support and sales, that is one important function. The benefit of cost, you get greater cost savings, and it is your first step towards increased communication and collaboration, not only amongst yourself, but towards the customers as well. So why offer SIP trunking? Why should a service provider worry about offering SIP trunking when what he's offering right now is perfectly good? A, Infinitix predicts, Infinitix is a very famous uh, research firm. It predicts that uh, in SIP trunking is going to have a growth rate, and this is a compounded annual growth rate of around 89% till 2013. That's a very high percentage of revenue to be missing out on. On top of that, all these service providers around the world are soon going to be on SIP. You need to interconnect with them as well. And it's easier to interconnect with them if you're using the same technology. <sighs> Other than that, there are two main terms that service providers deal with. One is the ARPU, the churn. If all the service providers are offering similar offerings to their end customers, there's really nothing that differentiates them. You know, That's when churn becomes a very important scenario. I come from India, where mobile penetration is really high. And to give you an example, all service providers seem the same. They offer the same handsets. They offer the same service plans. The result being, they jump from service provider to service provider every month. And the ARPU from, from Indian customers is, isn't high at all. The churn rate is the highest. And you don't want that scenario happening. You want to provide bundled services, differentiated services. As I said, uh, there is a move towards services through the cloud. Now, if you could include that with your SIP trunking offering, integrate the CRM system for the end customer, integrate the customer support system for the end customer, and give them SIP trunking, it adds value towards the SIP trunking application. You are now becoming the enablers for the customer's business. That's why I think it's going to be a key provisioning or key uh, solution that you need to provide to the end customers in the coming years. What is good and all? Uh, I it has value, but there is something stopping you. So what's stopping you? There are some issues which we will look at. I've divided the issues into three parts. One is issues which are general to the service provider, uh, issues like downstream QoS, the voice quality, uh, issues with legacy PBX, and issues with IP-based PBX. Let's take a look at the general issues. As you can see, the internet is a very fair medium. Uh, it treats all traffic equally. The problem with that, of course, is if it treats all traffic equally, it's going to treat your voice traffic equally as well. And if I'm, I'm a user who is in the vicinity of a voice, you know, voice call which is taking place, and I start using a software client like Kaza to do a peer-to-peer -peer download, it's going to impact my traffic completely to the extent where voice packets start getting dropped. And the human e ear, the human ear is very sustainable and discernible. It can make out sounds even if a few packets are lost. But if, if that happens a lot, then the sound quality gets mugged up and you get what we know as we know as delays in your voice or completely missing out. And something like this would happen. I talking to you. It just doesn't make sense. You don't want this issue from to happen. The re to avoid this from happening, you need something to control the downstream voice quality. And that's what Patton gives you with downstream QoS. <laughs> what we saw is we need a mechanism which not only makes sure that your real-time traffic is given a higher priority, but it is given higher priority without the service provider getting involved in the QoS mechanism. It has to be sustainable such that you deploy the boxes and it gives QoS solution for the end customer. What we do is we introduce a dynamic bo bottleneck. That's a virtual bottleneck, by the way. Yeah, if we see that that virtual bottleneck of non-real-time traffic is getting filled up, only then we'll drop the non-real-time traffic. And non-real-time traffic can recover from a few packets lost, not the voice traffic. As a result of this, we create a, a free pathway for your VoIP traffic 
as a result of which the quality is you know the quality is maintained not only that uh, our dsps have the best uh, voice processing engine in them so combine this with the with the voice quality that you get because of that downstream qos and you have a solution which compares up mean of mean opinion score wise to pstn as well survivability now why is survivability important from from the very base of it survivability is important because that's how your telephony is the only way your enterprises your business customers are in communication with their customers with their end customers if they lose contact all contact with their customers is broken that's not a good thing the pstn has high availability high survivability you want same thing to offer with your wipe services as well not to mention the fact that the data network is highly survivable if one of the links goes down if one of the routers go down your data network is still intact you're still reaching your traffic so you want to have something like that in your voice network as well and that's how the the way we do it the way we do it is with our call session fallback routing engine what we do is we basically make sure that all the destinations that we have here have a fallback with so it can be any destination to any interface fallback mechanism so basically you can have a pstn interface backing up a sip interface a sip interface itself backing up a sip interface and of course pstn to pstn fallback as well to us we leave this completely upon your choice it's highly configurable you can add up to 20 destinations here and th that can show you how deployable it is and this can be applicable to all calls on the smart node what that means is it can be a sip to sip call it can be a sip to pstn call or it can be just a pstn to pstn call that you might have uh, being like a pri to pri call that you are supporting you could support that with a sip gateway as well so to me this makes the solution that you offer to your customers highly survivable as well which is one key issue when it comes to enterprises network management uh, this is a very important uh, scenario especially because enterprises do not want to get into the hassle of configuring they do not want to get into the hassle of getting a device configuring from their point of view and you want to have a solution whereby you can just have a system that you sell a smart node and its configuration is there in the database gets loaded as soon as the, s the network uh, is brought alive the way we do it is with auto provisioning here's an example as you can see the customer buys a smart node you have your uh, system integrated with us the customer buys a smart node a, a the, the system generates the configuration for it it is stored on the on the web it's always looking out for the smart node as soon as the smart node is plugged into the network it has dhcp enabled on it the configuration is downloaded the customer doesn't have any hassle of configuring anything the customer doesn't even need to know that there is a cpe device in his in his uh, premises for all he cares his services are on as soon as he switches it on facts uh, let me take a break here to say i actually am surprised that we still use fax uh, technology has come such a long way that we can send voice packets over ip not just to us on the earth we can send them to the moon as well we can do uh, twitter from moon and i'm still surprised that we we are facing issues with fax but be that as it may we still have issues with fax and you need to solve those issues when you're providing sip trunking as well you need to have a solution which allows them to use their fax machines in the same way that they have been used to using it how we do it is two ways we can do it either by fax bypass or by t38 fax relay i'll take a look at both of them the fax bypass is the default scenario used by a lot of vendors including cisco what it does is it basically is using the same g711 calling that you use and sending fax packets over it it's a good enough solution uh, but a it uses a lot of bandwidth b it has no resiliency in it someone might ask me why not use a codec like g729 to save on bandwidth the problem is g729 is a very lossy algorithm and you're using modems on both side two modems even a single lost packet completely changes the facts and the contents of it so you cannot use anything but the g711 here it's good but it's not as reliable as the fax t38 solution what we do here is we do do fax and this is a standard as well it's not something that patent propagates it's a standard as well we do do fax 
what voice over IP does to telephony. It basically packetizes data. It packetizes data at one end and sends it towards the other end. The fax machines don't even know that they are receiving packetized data. For them, it's the same fax transmission. The advantage here is the higher reliability. Now, how do we do that? Consider that we are sending out three packets, packet one, packet two, packet three. What we do is you can do resiliency in such a way that packet two and packet three are then transmitted with packet four, and then subsequently packet three and packet four with packet five. Now, I did not put this up on, on the board because I don't want you guys to think that that's the limitation that we impose. In fact, you could do n number of counts of resiliency here. So you could send five packets together with the next packet. It's, it's all up to you. Well, you would say it would use more bandwidth, right, if you were to do such kind of redundancy. Not quite. It still uses less bandwidth than the G711 codec. And so to me, T38 is the way to go with fax, not just with step trunking, but with IP telephony in general. If your vendor does not support T38, then you better get him to support T38, because this standard is the standard that is going to be, and this is recommended by the ITU as well. So this is the standard which is going to go forward uh, as we go along with IP telephony. <sighs> so those were a couple of general issues that, uh, and fax is my favorite issue, because it is it is like, like that nagging pain, which you think you have gotten rid of, but it just keeps on recurring. So it's something that you guys will face a lot as, as we move towards an IP-based environment and IP telephony in general. <sighs> Issues with legacy PBX. Well, what can I say about legacy PBXs? They, they were really good at what they did, highly available, highly reliable, uh, allowed you to do inter-office communication, even if your connection with the provider was broken, but they have outlived their welcome. To be really honest, I think five years, 10 years ago, these guys, these PBXs were the solution you wanted, but not anymore. They don't add any value. Uh, to make them IP enabled is a very costly affair as well. So what do you wi do with them? The customer still wants to use their legacy PBX. They might not have realized the return on investment on the legacy PBX. On top of that, they want to use this with SIP trunking, knowing that the legacy PBX doesn't understand IP at all, which, which is fine. You could, you could have a gateway which would connect to your legacy PBX, connect to the service provider, solve the problems. But then legacy pr PBX doesn't want you to be uh, safe. If they have analog legacy PBXs, they have ISDN legacy PBXs, they have TDM-based legacy PBXs, what do you do? Do you invest in three different platforms to support this? That's not the solution. As you can see here, uh, between 70 to 90% of enterprises in Europe have ISDN-based PBXs, but there are still 30 and 10% on a lower side, which have other PBXs deployed. So you need a platform which can support all of these PBXs under a single umbrella. You don't need to teach your guys different mechanisms to control these legacy PBXs. So what do we need? We need to integrate different legacy platforms under a single umbrella. We need to SIP trunking enable the legacy PBX in, in common words. But the most important thing is we need to have a phased and easy migration. Enterprises do not want a tectonic shift in the way they do things. Users don't want to learn new things. The, the most difficult thing for any technology to get adapted is to teach users to do them. And so what you want is a way in which you can hide what is happening inside to from the end user completely. That's a phased migration. So what we do is we, we make a VoIP gateway act as a mediator. How do we do that? Have a look. As you can see, the 4960 sits between the IP side of the network and the PB legacy-based PBX. It acts not only as the converter, that is it allows the legacy PBX to do SIP trunking, but it also connects to the PSTNs. The advantage of doing this is you can do a phased migration. The enterprise can have both of them working together. So he gets called from the PSTN as well. He gets called from the IP-based uh, network as well. So until he's satisfied with the IP-based offerings, they can be kept on this model. If they think that their IP-based mod offering is cost-effective, it is providing them more value, then they can be taken away from the PSTN. Alternatively, you could still offer them a fallback via the PSTN. So most of the local and long distance calls goes over the IP network. The other calls, if required, can use the PSTN. The advantage to that being, 
the availability of their solution increases very higher. Um, one of the biggest advantages of using a smart node here is the again the session manager that I talked about, the session router. It is the session router that allows you to do this type of schema because you can do any to any switching inside the smart node. So this is something which many customers in Western Europe and uh, the North America have been uh, deploying to convince their customers, to convince the enterprises to move towards SIP trunking. They want to show them that SIP trunking is no different from from your legacy deployments, but it has more values in that it enables unified communications ultimately. So this is the way they get them to start migrating. And it has worked wonders for a lot of big firms. IP-based PBXs. I would say the market for IP PBXs is still in its infancy, but there are a lot of issues that IP PBXs need solving out. And some of the few we'll look at. Interoperability. Wow, that word is the key word with IPPBXs more than anything else. What we see is the service providers and IPPBXs are moving at different pace when deploying standards. What is happening is that service providers are more aware of the fact that there need to be standards-based deployment, whereas the PBXs are most often open source-based PBXs. Even if a draft comes out on the uh, ITF side, they are likely to deploy it. Uh, the reason being, it might enable a function which is critical to one of the customers. However, the problem is, how do these two things, which are moving at a completely different pace, interop with each other? You need someone to mediate between them. On top of that, they would say, why do I have to use G711 codecs when I'm going from my LAN towards my VAN? Why can't I use a low bandwidth codec for doing that? And why can't I use my high bandwidth codec in the LAN where I have a lot of bandwidth available. So you want a mediator who decides which calls to go with which codec or in general terms do a generic transcoding between codecs. So the mechanism needed is to ensure interop between the ITSP and the IPPBX. This is, this is one of the key issues with IPPBXs. To deploy general IPPBXs as is is not providing them SIP trunking. It's just providing them one half of the solution. Survivability. I keep stressing on this point again, and I can't stress on it enough. This is one of the most important issues when dealing with enterprise customers. The moment they get cut off from their business clients is the moment they are going to shout at the service providers. So there, need to be, there needs to be a mechanism which ensures survivability. Right in this scenario here, if the IPVBX were to go down, the result would be all the calls going towards the ITSP would fail. But a, even a bigger problem would happen is that all calls within the LAN would fail. So a sales organization in the company wouldn't be able to talk to the support guys. And if it cannot even do local switching, then the whole point of deploying IPVBXs fails, right? What we do is we need a solution which ensures that this solution is survivable, that even if the IPVBX were to go down temporarily, it could be for maintenance purposes as well. If even if the IPVBX goes down temporarily, there is a solution in place which can take care of it. Another thing that we see increasingly is with small to medium businesses in particular is multiple requirements at the edge. You can see from the picture here, there's a QoS policy manager, there's a WAN router, there's a DHCP server. On top of that, some enterprises demand VPN uh, routers as well. Now, these are such a lot of devices that you as a service provider has to maintain uh, and has to make sure that they, they are up to standards by what you have set. We think that you can have a single device sitting at the edge, take care of all these functions. It could be your security device, it, it would also manage the QoS, it would manage the WAN routing needs, as well as be the DHCP server, the VPN server as well. And this is not just patent that thinks that way. The industry standard thinks that the session border controller, the device, could take care of all these functions in IP trunking. So we need an integrated device, a session border controller to handle all these. This is what the patent solution is. This is the patent session border controller, the 5200. To give you an example of what, what a session border controller would do in this scenario is, it would not only allow you to do SIP trunking, it would be it would be doing QoS management, it would be doing VPN management, it would be doing firewall functions, it would be your DHCP server, your IP router, everything rolled into one. For most small to medium businesses, 
if you can ensure that you send out a single device and that makes their whole network alive, this is going to be the solution they want. It makes it easier for them to understand what they are deploying and it makes the solution survivable. Some of the features that we can go over are you can do 32 simultaneous sessions on this device. On top of that, we have done a lot of interrupt tests to ensure that the ITSPs, you guys, can easily interrupt it with the IP PBXs that are existing in the market. We also do routing on this guy. We, there are functions like VRRP, the Virtual Router Redundancy Protocol, to make sure that you have a solution which is not only redundant but can do load sharing as well, yes, through VRRP again. Uh, you have VPN termination on this device. You have QoS policy manager on this device. And this is active QoS policy management. This is the QoS policy management that someone like Cisco defines. We wanted to make sure that the QoS policy management was very detailed as well as active in this case because from small to medium enterprises, if they had to have another QoS manager here, it would just break the solution that we want to be providing them out and combine them with issues like fax, with uh, auto-provisioning, and you have a solution which can take care of most of the enterprise needs. As you can see, uh, this is one single device, and not just the 5200 that I'm talking about right now. I think the, se the session border controller is a single integrated device in general, which is going to be a critical device in the IP trunking scenario, the SIP trunking scenario. So let's take a look at SmartNode as a service provider CPE. The scenarios that we discussed were TDM-based PBX, which was being put onto SIP. Uh, we just discussed the IP PBX, which was being put onto SIP. You can have an ISDN PBX to put onto SIP and analog uh, connections onto SIP. The advantage that clearly comes out, not even looking at here, is that you have a single platform which will take care of all your needs. You don't need to retrain your, cus your customer service professionals. You don't need to retrain your network ops guys to design these scenarios. Everything is taken care of inside a single platform. What you have on top of that? You have active QoS, you have traffic shaping capabilities, you have downstream QoS for voice quality. On top of that, we have the industry best <laughs> solution for voice quality. You have survivability, uh, which I cannot stress how important it is. You have fax support, point of sale support, and deck functionality. I would want to talk a bit about deck functionality because it becomes very important when you're working in uh, wireless environments as well as in some fact scenarios as well because what we have is we have high we use high precision oscillators which no one in the industry does and that allows you to work with deck enabled devices as well as to work with facts uh, high precision facts uh, scenarios the best advantage is it allows smooth migration what you want to have as as i've written as a smart note there what you want to have is a is a solution which can work with SIP, which can work with H323, which can work with your legacy devices under a single platform. The smooth migration is defined by the number of hassles that you would be facing when you're deploying this solution. The lesser the hassles you face, the smoother the migration is. And so if, if there is a single platform which can enable all these solutions for you, SmartNode is the solution for you. I actually want to open the floor up for some questions because uh, this is what I thought was the main part of it. I, I would like to interact with you guys on uh, IP telephony issues, any questions that you might have with SIP trunking in general, quality of service issues. So, nothing. All right, man, I must have done a really good job then. <laughs> um, in the, what you can do is you can go to, the, to our website. There is uh, material here as well on our booth which is specifically on SIP trunking. This, because we think this is a technology which is going to be very prominent going forward and you guys can have a look at uh, that. You can have a look at our website. Uh, there is a white paper on SIP trunking which takes a look at SIP trunking in general. It doesn't take a look at SIP trunking through our eyes. It takes a look at SIP trunking in general, analyzes SIP trunking problems, the kind of solutions you need, and how Pattern can solve those problems for you. So thanks a lot for your attention, guys, and it was a pleasure talking to you.